Okay. So now we come to the conflict in which this country is involved, deeply involved, I would say. Understand that many conflicts have been discussed so far in this conference. Um, the, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is uh, one that is described often as the most difficult conflict, the most difficult conflict to solve. Um, whether this is justified or not, uh, it is certainly a protracted conflict, as uh, I think uh, Amal pointed out in his um, uh, synopsis. It is a protracted conflict in terms of time. It's a conflict that has been going on for more than 100 years. It's protracted uh, also in terms of the depth of this conflict. This is a conflict in which all the dimensions are involved. The um, historical, if you wish, the ethical, the cultural, the religious, um, the political, of course. Um, it is a conflict which uh, um, the realists in the capital R would describe as a conflict over scarce resources. It's a conflict over land and over water. Um, others would mention the fact that uh, this is a conflict in which uh, basic human needs are involved. The search for security, for recognition, all these dimensions um, are here. Um, we could also add to this the fact that this is a conflict that has been escalating. Um, in no time in the past, in the history of 100 years of conflict, has there been uh, so many losses of life uh, every week or every month, or if you want to measure it. There were clashes, of course, before World War I, uh, but those were not really political in nature. They were in nature of attacks of Bedouins and, or others on uh, settlers. It became political in 1920, and a few people were killed, uh, more religious in 1929. Um, again, a number of Jews and uh, Arabs were killed at that time. 1936 to 1939 was a more serious matter. It was a full-fledged uh, national rebellion of the Palestinians in this country. Um, it was more violent than the previous occasions, but still it did not reach the dimensions of the Intifada that we are experiencing today. The same would be true of uh, other um, violent uh, experiences. What the Fedayeen in the 50s, Fedayeen coming from Gaza, um, then the Fatah uh, starting its incursions in 1965 from Syria, the first Intifada, and now we have an Intifada in which uh, in certain months, a number of people killed on both sides reached dozens. This has not happened before. If you want to look at the bright side, perhaps not in the conflict, but on the, at the issue of accommodation, there is something new now in uh, this situation, in this conflict. Um, it may be said that at this stage of the conflict, the solution is quite obvious. Um, if you take today the Arab uh, Beirut initiative, the Clinton parameters, the Geneva um, agreement, uh, or you take the agreements at Taba after the Camp David the negotiations, you mix them together, this is the solution. There is no other one. And I think everybody who approaches this conflict in an analytical from an analytical um, angle, we'll have to admit it. The great problem is, of course, how to reach such a solution, and the parties are very far from it. We speak today about the um, roadmap, about starting bilateral negotiations before uh, the um, redeployment of the Israelis. These are all verbal rituals. Uh, there is absolutely no possibility to implement uh, the roadmap as it is required, and by uh, lateral negotiations to which uh, all parties paid allegiance in Sharm el-Sheikh and other places can uh, go nowhere um, considering the wide gap separating the positions of the two parties. So even from this point of view, there is very little comfort, but uh, 
eventually this problem, this conflict will also be solved. Let me say something about the participants. First, uh, Hassan Khatib, uh, whom you find in earlier versions of your uh, program, uh, could not come. And all those of you who are following developments nowadays uh, in uh, Palestinian territories uh, will understand why. Uh, his place is taken by Dr. Meir Litvak who will be the first speaker because he participates also in another conference. I don't know if our guests here are aware of the fact that there are a number of conferences running at the same time on this campus, and many of them are uh, on a subject that relates to the subject of this conference. Um, so Dr. Meir Litvak will present uh, his uh, paper, and he will leave immediately after that, and you must understand the reasons for that. Uh, Dr. May Litvak is a senior research fellow at the Diane Center. Uh, he is a senior lecturer at the Department of Middle Eastern and African Studies of this university. He published uh, a book called uh, Shi'i Scholars of 19th Century Iraq, the Ulama of Najaf and Karbala. And he is co-author of uh, uh, two other books, Perceptions of the Holocaust in the Palestinian Public Discourse, and the, the Reproduction repro representation of the Holocaust in the Arab world. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, I apologize for having to run. Uh, a major reason for the success of Hamas, uh, which sets it apart from other Islamist movements in the Arab world, is of being both an Islamic and a nationalist movement at the same time. This combination is the product of the unique Palestinian circumstances in which Hamas was founded, uh, not in the framework of an already an existing uh, state and in relation to a semi-secular Arab government, but in the context of a national conflict. Hamas was founded as the armed wing of the Muslim Brothers movement uh, in the Gaza Strip at the beginning of the Palestinian uprising, the Intifada, uh, in December 1987. Uh, through Hamas, uh, the Muslim Brothers hoped to play a major role in Palestinian politics uh, during a very crucial period. Uh, thus, Hamas formulated its ideology in rivalry, with the, in rivalry with the more secular PLO and in opposition to Zionist Israeli claims to the land. Seeking to appeal to wider constituencies, Hamas had to present itself uh, not uh, just as a religious alternative to the secular PLO, but also as a nationalist one. This combination did contain inherent tensions between the universalist uh, supranational identity of Islam and the particularist uh, national identity. Hamas reconciled this tension by Islamizing Palestinian identity and by injecting uh, its Islam or its Islamic identity with a, st a strong Palestinian component. Like all other Muslim Brother uh, movements, Hamas rejected nationalism as a, se as a secular, exclusivist, and selfish value. As a foreign implant uh, designed to break uh, down uh, Islamic unity in order to speed up uh, the Western takeover of Islamic lands. Yet, given the spread of nationalism in Egypt, uh, the Muslim Brothers, where it was founded, uh, reconciled uh, nationalism with Islam by endowing patriotism with Islamic meaning. It is religion which provides man uh, with true love of his homeland and the force to fight for it. Uh, the Muslim Brothers also describe the Arab nation as the only legitimate national entity within the Islamic uh, Ummah or the community of believers. Moreover, the Islamic Ummah needed the existence of the Arab nation, uh, which would provide it, uh, the spiritual power for achieving uh, its liberation and redemption. Therefore, uh, Arab unity was, a vital, was vital to the restoration and unity of the Islamic Ummah. The Muslim Brothers uh, spoke of a hierarchy of concentric circles of identity in which patriotism and Arab nationalism ultimately led to Islamic unity in one supra-territorial and supra-racial homeland. Uh, the Muslim Brother organizations which operated in the West Bank and Gaza up to 1967 adopted these concepts. During the years in which the unique Palestinian identity grew stronger, they still viewed the Palestinian tragedy uh, through an Islamic uh, prism and emphasized what they called the Islamic essence of the Palestinian problem. In the political sphere, uh, the brothers in the West Bank supported unity with, uh, with Jordan. 
the delay in adopting Palestinian nationalism, as well as their uh, reservations from armed struggle against Israel, as long as the necessary preconditions were not met, that is, the return of the Palestinian people to Islam or to full religious life, were among the reasons for the relatively weakness of the Muslim Brothers compared uh, with the armed organizations, with the other armed organizations, mainly Fatah. Yet the Muslim Brothers uh, could not remain untouched by the wider forces that supported the growth of Palestinian identity. Around the Middle East, the decline of Pan-Arabism encouraged the consolidation of territorial identity. The conflict with, Israel, with the Israeli occupation accelerated the formation of a distinct Palestinian identity. For Islamist activists born under Israeli occupation, the natural political frame of reference was Palestinian. Members of this generation who had been disappointed by the PLO saw the Islamic path as the remedy for the national predicament. Over time, Islamic and Palestinian identity became enmeshed. The growth of the Islamic movement entailed the assimilation of the prevalent national and ideological discourse in Palestinian society. The culmination of this process was the founding of Hamas as the political and military wing of the Muslim Brothers, again combining both elements. The integration of Palestinian identity within the Islamic one is, the most, is most revealing in Hamas's ma major ideological and canonical, canonical text, the Hamas Covenant. Uh, the Covenant's opening statement defines Hamas as an Islamic movement which draws its ideas, terminology, and concepts from Islam. Article 2 describes Haza uh, Hamas as a branch of the Muslim Brothers movement in Palestine which it says is a universal, universal movement in the largest, and the largest Islamist movement in the world. While Article 6 declares that Hamas is a distinctive Palestinian uh, movement striving to hoist Allah's uh, flag on every piece of land of Pal in Palestine. The very definition of Palestine and its borders reflect the, the impact of nationalist ideologies. Hamas spokesmen acknowledge that Palestine in its present borders had never existed as one political or administrative unit during, uh, during the millennium of Muslim rule uh, over in Palestine, from 638 to 1917. They also condemn the modern political divisions of the Middle East as a product of Western designs. And nonetheless, they take these very borders and map, and map as their point of departure in discussing the land and people of Palestine. The map of Palestine, which Hamas uses, is the one drawn up by the British mandatory power a practice that confirms Benedict, Benedict Anderson's ob observation that over time nationalists of, uh, often endorse administrative colonial borders as the borders of their fatherland. Now how did Hamas justify the elevation of Palestinian component in its ideology to such a central position? Like all other Muslim brothers, uh, Hamas extols uh, patriotism as part of the Islamic uh, belief system, but Hamas goes further saying that there is no greater patriotism than a situation when, when the enemy usurps a Muslim land. Therefore, the struggle is waged over Palestine's Islamic, not national, identity. Ordinary forms of, of patriotism evolve out of material and human factors. But the patriotism of Hamas also encompasses divine factors which endow it with spirit and vitality. The Egyptian and Syrian Muslim brothers justify their local patriotism by pointing to the central roles uh, the respective uh, countries had played in Islamic history. Hamas could not follow the, sa the same uh, model since, as I said, Palestine never existed as a, as a political administrative uh, entity under the various Muslim empires and never housed a major political center. Rather, Hamas articulated uh, a, sp a spiritual Islamic meaning for Palestinian identity and, and patriotism which stems from the sanctity of Palestine as a holy Islamic land. Another major reason for sanctifying Palestine was the need to refute and perhaps even appropriate Jewish religious claims on the sanctity of the land of Israel. In some respect, the religious uh, Jewish and Islamic claims on Palestine present an image mirror of each other. The Islamic sanctity of Palestine, according to Hamas, is based on several elements the most important of which is God's choice of Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem as the place for the ascension of the Prophet Muhammad uh, to heaven, which is, which is called Al-Isra wal miraj and, and Al-Aqsa Mosque being the first Qibla, or direction of prayer uh, for the Muslims. The sanctity of Al-Aqsa, the prayer of Palestine, of Jerusalem, 
is extended to Palestine uh, as a whole, which is repeatedly called the land of Al-Isra wal Miraj. Uh, the land of the Isra and Miraj, these two uh, phenomena Hamas maintain, distinguish uh, Palestine from all other Islamic lands and made it the inheritance of all Muslims. In no other capital city in the world, uh, states one of Hamas uh, handbills, did an event like the Isra wal Miraj take place except in Jerusalem. So, so that it will be the sister of Mecca and Medina in history, so that the Muslims will know that abandoning Jerusalem is tantamount to abandoning Mecca and Medina. Few writers go as far as implicitly, implicitly elevating uh, Jerusalem and Palestine above Mecca and Medina. In explaining Palestine's position in the heart of, of the Muslims, one writer cites an 8th century um, scholar who describes the uh, concentric circles of identity which start from the holiest one, the rock from which the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven, then temp Temple Mount, Jabal al-Masjid, Jerusalem, Palestine, Sham, geographic Syria, and finally the whole world. Another uh, Hamas uh, writer depicts Palestine as part of the Islamic faith, the heart of the world in general and of, of the Islamic world in particular. It is the epitome of Islam and its symbol in the world. Without its heart, Palestine, the, the Islamic nation would be dead historically and culturally. In extending the sanctity of, Pal of Jerusalem to all of Palestine, Hamas revived traditions which go back to the early periods of Islam. The term the Holy Land is first mentioned in the Quran in relation to the Jews when Moses spoke uh, to the children of Israel about uh, uh, their entry there, but not uh, to Muhammad's uh, ascension to heaven. Uh, it appeared, a tree appeared in early Islamic literature with the development of the concept of uh, its sanctity as the land of uh, the prophets where God, God revealed himself. The borders of this holy land, however, were never defined. Most often it was perceived as extending from the Euphrates in the north to Sinai and the Hijaz in the south, from the desert to the sea. Gradually, the term Sham, or geographic Syria, replaced the term holy land uh, a phenomenon uh, manifested uh, inter alia in the appearance of uh, the literature which is called uh, Fadai al-Sham or the praise of the Sham rather than, rather than uh, Fadai al-Filastin or praise of Filistine, which never appeared uh, parallel to the literature of uh, the praise of Jerusalem. The integration of the Islamic and national discourse is not new in Palestinian uh, history. The religious idiom has always played an important role in the evolution of Palestinian nationalism and in the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. But in the past, it was mostly the nationalist Palestinian elites, the notables during the British Mandate period and Fatah movement uh, since the early 1960s, which employed is Islamic symbols and themes in order to mobilize popular support for the national cause. By contrast, uh, Hamas has been first and foremost a religious movement. The Islamic idiom has been uh, central to its ideology, and its ultimate goal is the establishment of an Islamic uh, state and society. Hamas harnesses and subordinates the nationalist idiom to its religious agenda as shown by the depiction of, 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 uh, of the Palestinian cause as a matter of faith and religion, not one of earth and soil. Whereas the PLO had stressed national liberation as its raison d'etre, Hamas described itself as struggling, struggling also to defend the Muslim person, Islamic culture, and Muslim holy sites. Uh, the second major component in Palestine's sanctity, according to Hamas, is, is its designation as a waqf, as a holy religious endowment, by the second caliph, uh, Omar. And according to Hamas, when the Muslims uh, conquered Palestine, uh, the caliph, uh, Omar, decided not to divide the conquered land among the victorious soldiers, but to establish it as, an, as a waqf, an inalienable religious endowment. This assertion, however, somewhat diminishes Palestine distinctiveness, since, as Hamas uh, concedes, every land conquered by the Muslims is a waqf. More importantly, as a waqf, Palestine does not belong only to the Palestinians or to the Arabs, but to the entire Muslim nation until the day of resurrection. Hamas presents this point as a major argument against any compromise, territorial compromise with Israel, say that no Muslim party or leadership, Palestinian or otherwise, has the right to concede even an inch from Palestine, neither in this generation nor in any other generation in the future. The depiction of Palestine as a waqf 
constitutes an invention of tradition, since it had no legal basis in the Islamic, uh, Islamic law. Lands conquered by the Muslims were considered by Islamic law as Dar al-Islam, or the abode of Islam. That is a place where uh, sovereignty belonged to the Muslims, and, the, and Islamic law prevailed, but no country had, had or has had the legal status of a, of a waqf. Now, every national movement, and the Palestinian national movement included, views and shapes the past according to its current goals and aspirations, often using the past as a tool in contemporary political controversies. Palestinian historiography in recent years has extended great efforts to demonstrate that within the larger Arab milieu, Palestine and the Palestinians had maintained distinct features and identity throughout history. In addition to the need to shape a collective national memory, this histori historiographical effort was largely motivated by the need to refute uh, Zionist claims in Palestine. By establishing a claim on the land predating uh, the Israelite settlements, uh, this historiography sought to demonstrate the Arab and Palestinian nature of Palestine, which was preserved thanks to its historical continuity, thanks to the historical continuity of the Palestinians over their land. The advent of Hamas had led to the emergence of an Islamist narrative of, of history. A major point of dispute between nationalist and Islamist narratives of history in the Arab world was their respective attitude toward the pre-Islamic past. The nationalists, often under the guidance of the state, incorporated this past in the national heritage in order to enhance the legitimacy of the territorial nation state. By contrast, Islamist historians regarded this period as jahili, that is the dark age of uh, ignorance and barbarity before Islam. The historical version uh, articulated by Hamas is not aimed at disputing the nationalist secular uh, narrative so much as to refute Jewish claims and to provide a historical justification for opposing any compromise on Palestine. Consequently, Hamas legitimizes the pre-Islamic or ancient Palestinian past of Palestine or the Canaanite past of Palestine by describing the ancient Canaanites as Arabs and more importantly uh, by arguing that Palestine had been an Islamic land since the, time, since the time of the patriarch I. Abraham. Palestine, according to this version, is the land where the first contact took place between heaven and earth, between the divine and human, through the monotheistic uh, uh, message delivered uh, by the patriarch Abraham. Abraham, or Ibrahim, was an Arab from the Arab tribes of, of, uh, of Babel or Babylon. He was a Hanif, that is a true believer, and a Muslim. He was not a Jew, as the Jews falsely claim, and it was he who had built the mosque of Al-Aqsa uh, in Jerusalem prior to the Prophet Muhammad, thereby making Palestine an Islamic land from that time onward. The logical conclusion of the Islamization of Palestine in its past is the complete merging of Palestinian identity with Islam by making Islam the principal component of Palestinian identity. This convergence raises the, the problem of the role of the Palestinian Christians, particularly when Hamas presents itself as a movement of all Palestinians both Muslims and Christians. Such statements stand in sharp contrast to the hostility of the Muslim brothers toward Christians in other Arab countries. And it was probably motivated by the need to mobilize all national resources to the struggle against Israel in order to refute the PLO's claim that Hamas stresses its Islamic essence, that the, the stress on the Islamic essence of Palestine undermines Palestinian national unity. Hamas solved this contradiction uh, by describing the Christians in Palestine as Muslims, whether, the, whether by religion or culture, even if not by religion. Sorry, whether by, um, whether by culture and history, if, even if not by religion. Hamas explains further that the Christians in Palestine are different from those of the West in their history and way of life. Even though they share the same religion, they suffered equally with the Muslims from Western imperialism and from Zionism. Uh, Hamas reconciles the tension between its enhanced Palestinian orientation and adherence to the pan-Islamic ideal by, by making a distinction between the short-term goal, the complete liberation of Palestine and the establishment of an Islamic state in Palestine, and the long-term goal of universal Islamic state and the restoration of the caliphate. Hamas's advocacy of pan-Islam is largely motivated by Palestinian considerations. Hamas acknowledges that its own jihad cannot, is not uh, cannot liberate Palestine by itself. Rather the, rather, the liberation of Palestine is linked to three circles, the Palestinian, the Arabs, and Islamic. 
Success in the, in the struggle for Palestine requires the unified efforts of all three. The liberation of Palestine would require a massive Islamic effort, which the worldwide uh, Islamic movement would channel into changing the political map in the Arab and Islamic homelands. Jerusalem, therefore, will be the starting point for the liberation and takeoff of the entire Muslim nation. Once the supranational Islamic State emerges, Jerusalem, re rather than Mecca, will serve as the new capital of Islam and the Muslims all over the world. Such a view, which elevates Jerusalem above Mecca, again constitutes a departure from the status according to Jerusalem vis-à-vis uh, -vis Mecca in, pe in, previous, uh, in earlier periods and in a certain way completes the ideological uh, circle. Initially, Hamas endorsed an Islamized Palestinian nationalism in order to appeal to wider constituencies. Yet, paradoxically, this very process has led to the draping of the original pan-Islamic idea with so much Palestinian cloth that Hamas appears now to have, to have subordinated Islamic unity to Palestinian symbols and meanings. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, I understand that in your absence, questions about Hamas are likely to be raised in view of the topicality uh, of this move. Um, do you, would you have time? Five minutes, because I... I, I... Five minutes, okay. And after that, all questions about Hamas will have to be addressed to your colleagues, Mayor, in the panel, please. Five minutes, brief question for a brief answer. Rabbi Shah, please, reach out. Reach out the sea. Very briefly, if you could maybe just say a little bit more about the implications that the is that the implications of uh, the Islamicization of Palestinian uh, identity having for uh, Muslim. Uh, Christian relations among Palestinians? Uh, Christian, Palestinian Christians apparently uh, would never say it out, uh, out, outwardly, out loud, are probably concerned with it. You can see uh, an increasing emigration of Palestinian Christians from the Palestinian territories in recent years. And uh, if you read uh, some foreign news reports, you, did, you, you could see uh, some fear mm -hmm. about the future. Amal will also relate to this question in his presentation. I just wanted to ask this question. Would it affect the relationship between Muslims and Christians? I think what it relates directly to the Hamas. I think. I think what the problem is. Okay. Tensions between Muslims and Christians in the Middle East are not related to Palestine. In Egypt, they are much more, they are much worse than, the, than in here, and, and they are not related to Palestine. They are part of a much broader problem or crisis. Okay. Professor Smocha. What are the pragmatic elements? Uh, I will leave it to Asher Sasset. <laughs> 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 we heard a lot about ideology. Okay. Mm -hmm. I true. I agree, but this is one topic of my paper. The subject is too broad. One last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a topic of the paper to some extent because you started by talking about Benedict Anderson's perception about the adjustment of uh, national claim to borders, colonial borders, and this is what's happening now in Hamas. They are adjusting part of the discourse to the 67 borders, uh, and this runs uh, some tension to the ideology of the uh, entire uh, uh, Palestinian worker, and also with the entire. Uh, Yes, I think you have to make a distinction here between ideology and uh, it is true that Hamas, there are some segments in Hamas are willing to at least accept temporarily the 67 borders. But this is the point. They emphasize this is temporary, therefore it, not, it is not peace or final settlement with the Israelis, it is only a temporary ceasefire which does not mean that Hamas abandons, according to their perception, or at least declarations, that Hamas abandons the national goal of liberating all of Palestine. That is, here they make the clear distinction now. Whether or not in the, in the hundred years from now, Hamas will readjust its ideology to this uh, reality is a different question, which may take or may not take place. Uh, no, I think uh, 
we have to um, honor our promise to uh, Mayor Litvak to release him at this point. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think some of the issues that are invited by this paper will probably be discussed also by the other speakers. The second speaker is um, uh, Dr. Amal Jamal. He is the incoming head of the Department of Political Science at Tel Aviv University. Uh, he is uh, the head of the Walter Liebach Center for Jewish and Arab Coexistence. He specializes in Israeli and Palestinian nationalist movements. His uh, two recent works are uh, Palestinian National Movement, Politics at Contention, and uh, Media Politics and Democracy in Palestine. I'll start with a, a comment about time. Uh, everything is uh, temporary. In regard to Hamas's uh, policies, or in everything is temporary, and I think I'll comment on that in my uh, in my paper somehow. Although I uh, I feel you know uh, I didn't have the chance to attend uh, many of the presentations, unfortunately, because it's the end of the uh, school year and uh, we have, as you know, to teach. But um, I have uh, some fears in regard to the language I'm going to speak. So uh, excuse me if I'm not clear about certain issues. Uh, I'll try to be as uh, clear as possible. My language will be different, although Oren Yiftach uh, El relaxed me, relaxed me, tried to relax me this morning, that some people did speak this language, uh, which, is, uh, which is not the mainstream. Anyway, um, the israeli Palestinian conflict as uh, has been said uh, several times already, is one of the most protected conflicts in modern history, as you may uh, know. It is a conflict every, uh, over every aspect of the human existence in this area. It is a conflict over time, uh, space, place, identity, morality, history, resources, and even modes of struggle. Yeah? Even how to struggle for the uh, uh, national interests is, is uh, under discussion in this uh, conflict. The presence of these factors altogether in what makes, is what makes this conflict hard to resolve. Israelis and Palestinians have been fighting each other for the last 120 years. It seems that this struggle will not end in the near future. In the following paper, I aim to analyze the subtext of the conflict, utilizing several analytical tools for this purpose. My analysis of the conflict addresses six dimensions. These dimensions are uh, complementary and feed each other mutually. They are not fully developed and seek to introduce some form of contemplation on the conflict rather than deep analysis of it. Although I address, address both sides of the conflict, I would like to make clear that I do not view them in equal terms. I do not also view them in bipolar, bipolar uh, or dichotomous terms. Israel has more power and therefore is more responsible, at least for what has been going on in the last 40 years. Nevertheless, the two sides switch roles sometimes, as I'll try to demonstrate. I will start with history and narrativity. Each of the two sides utilizes history in order to demonstrate his ancient relationship with the land of Palestine, Israel, and narrates this relationship in a total form that excludes the other side. And uh, Mir Litvak's uh, uh, presentation has uh, demonstrated the way uh, the Hamas or the Muslim Brotherhood is, uh, views this, uh, this aspect of history and relativity. Black historical holes are filled with national romanticism. And wherever each of these national movements uh, doesn't have enough uh, support of its own narrative, of course, romanticism becomes a very active uh, dimension of uh, national memory. The Jewish historical narrative has become over the time the dominant one, silencing Palestinian history. Zionist narrativity was based on two main axes. The first is time and the second is space. There is a dialectical relationship between the two dimensions, of course. Time is a socio-political institution in which the humans organize our, uh, uh, we are humans organize our life as Nobat Elias claims. Therefore, one differentiates between linear versus secular time, continuous versus fractured time, full versus uh, empty time, primitive versus modern time, fast versus slow time, and so on. 
These differences are socio-politically constructed, of course. They are usually used in political conflicts in order to characterize the enemy and justify the na national subjectivity. Space, the second axis, is also a socio-political institution. One differentiates between land and territory, territory and homeland, and so on and so on. The relationship with the land could be instrumental as well as romantic, could be political as well as cultural, could be secular as well as religious. The Zionist narrative claimed that Jews have rich history in Palestine and sought to bridge the temporal gap that was created as a result of the forceful exile of the Jews by emptying Palestine from any history during Jewish absence. In Heideggerian terms, Zionist narrative suspended Palestinian history and emptied it from any historical or cultural meaning in order to justify its own history. The suspension of Palestinian time is manifested in different policies in the space in which the conflict takes place. One of the main tools of suspending the Palestinian time-space relationship is by othering the Palestinians and turning them into non-people. The dehumanization of the Palestinians, which started with the saying land without people for a people without a land, was transformed into a, new, into a new formula recently, such as no partner. There's no partner on the other side. This conception of the Palestinian other, who does not, as an equal human being, leads to the establishment of two separate temporal so zones. One is Israel, and the other is the occupied territories. Whereas the first reflects the sphere of normality, the second is the state of exception, as uh, Giorgio Agamben uh, defines it. In the state of exception, the difference between humans and animals disappear, and death, which is another form of temporal suspension, becomes a legitimate tool to guarantee life in the sphere of normality. Of course, this interplay between exception and normality is very important in the Israeli uh, political uh, discourse and historical narrative of, of the Zionist movement in general. The Palestinian national narrative sought to reject, on the other hand, of course, the Palestinian national narrative sought to reject Zionist timing and its translation into space, but did not manage very much. Although the Palestinian National Declaration defined Jews as non-people, it never had the power to become a history. Palestinian National Narrative had to consider the demographic facts that were created after the 1948 war and was never able to suspend Jewish temporal con conception of Palestine. Although we witnessed slight change in both narratives in the last decades, there is much work to be done in order to promote serious negotiations between the two timings of the two peoples. Being bo both sides, especially the powerful one, still seeks to recollect his memories to defend his superiority. The rise, on the other hand, the rise of the religious narrative in the Palestinian national movement uh, reshuffles the whole timing game. It is leading to growing tension and new interactions that are leading to new forms of violence between two si the two sides. And I would like to elaborate on this point. As I said before, the, the state of exception in the West Bank, and as defined by Israel, of course, and the state of normality inside Israel, uh, is manifested in different ways, but I, I can't uh, elaborate more on that. I would like to clarify that in, in, when we look at the meaning, real meaning of this uh, uh, zoning uh, of time, uh, it's, it's translated, of course, into active policies, uh, security policies, in which the, uh, uh, the existence of normality has to be, uh, uh, has to be um, established based on the state of exception or policies in the state of exception in which death or killing what is called uh, ticking bombs or uh, political leaders or military leaders in the other side or uh, um, uh, leading, uh, uh, establishing a very strict uh, uh, um, uh, no? How do you call it now? Uh, checkpoints, checkpoints policy uh, policies is very, very est uh, deeply established. And when we look at checkpoints uh, through time, I think it, 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 it makes clear what do I mean about uh, this uh, uh, zoning of time. When, uh, and I don't know how many of you have experienced this, but I've experienced it several times. Uh, when, when, uh, when, one, uh, when one of us meets or comes to, uh, to a, a checkpoint, 
Uh, of course, there is a difference, a major difference of power between the soldiers in the checkpoint and the Palestinians who try to pass. And the soldiers have the power to suspend Palestinian time by asking them to wait. And the fact that you are asked to wait, of course, means that you lose, as a human being, you lose your control of your own timing. If you want to pass from Ramallah, for instance, to uh, Birzeit, the University of Birzeit, it takes usually 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It sometimes could take an hour or two or seven even, because your time is suspended by soldiers on the uh, checkpoint. And uh, this uh, suspension of time uh, dehumanizes human beings, because human beings are temporal beings. We like to control our time. We like to control our, uh, uh, our plans. And, uh, and this has, of course, another dimension, which means the dehumanization of human beings or of Palestinians in the checkpoints. And I'm not talking, of course, about one person or two. I'm talking about the, the checkpoints in different places in the, in the occupied territories. Uh, 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 d uh, of course, uh, erases the difference between those who are dangerous and the, those who are normal or uh, regular human beings, regular Palestinians. This is on the one hand. The other hand, it means also that these people who are waiting have no control of how long they're going to wait. And you should imagine or try to imagine what happens to people who are asked to wait for some time that they can't control. And what does it lead to? I mean, this, this conception of time, this conception of timing, uh, and the losing of the control of time le could lead to different uh, uh, patterns of behavior. And uh, although I can't get deeper than that, of course, I've, I've written a, a whole paper about this issue, uh, but it means in many cases uh, that uh, uh, the empty time during, the, uh, 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 during waiting in the checkpoint uh, could have implications on the relationship between this person who is waiting at the checkpoint and the soldiers. And it, 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 of course, it means it could be translated into, in many cases, into aggression. The second point I would like to address is morality and power. In the Republic, Plato establishes a very complex relationship between justice and power. One of the claims raised in the dialogues in the justice is that justice is the will of the powerful. I think that what is really meant in the discussion is that morality uh, uh, is, is justice. I raise this point because I think that one central problematic that has been seriously addressed in, that has been, has, hasn't been seriously addressed in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the relationship between justice or morality and power. The conflict has been about the relationship between morality and power all along. Both sides frame their positions in moral terms and utilize the Protestant ethics in regard to the relationship between success and morality. I do not intend to raise the difference between occupier and occupied, especially after the 1967 war, but I still think that there is a need to unite, to unite the complex relationship between power and morality in both sides. The metaphor of Goliath and David is one example of the utilization of morality in order to promote political goals. Whereas this myth was first utilized by the Jews, by the Jewish side, it became a strong Palestinian argument justifying the struggle against Israeli occupation after 1967. However, the use of the suicide bombings in Israeli civilian sites and the rise of Hamas to power in the Palestinian Authority have become efficient Israeli tool to reconfigure this formula again. Third point, presence and existence. Israelis and Palestinians establish an existential relationship with their homeland. Both utilize more or less the claim that their mere existence depends on their presence in this place or another. Whereas the Israelis use their power to enforce the, and guarantee the control of as much land as possible, uh, and empty, uh, empty of Palestinians, the Palestinians seek to destabilize the existential stability and normality of Jewish existence in Tel Aviv, for instance. Since Palestinians are not sovereign, they cannot enforce their conception of the relationship between presence and existence on Israelis. The Israeli side, on the other hand, which is the powerful side, has developed a complex relationship between presence and existence. The meaning of existence in Israeli terms <coughs> uh, is Jewish, Jewish uh, sovereignty. The Israeli formula of presence 
Existence had to be changed and shift in its meaning has major, major price, much of which has to be paid by the Palestinians. Since the occupation of 1967, Israel viewed settlement policies in two ways. The first has viewed settlement policies as a translation of the historical and cultural bond between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. The second has viewed settlement policies in security terms or as a translation of state sovereignty over its territories. The two meanings went together until recently. The, ram the ramifications of this connection were not understood by the Israeli political and military elite until it became really difficult to separate between Jews and Palestinians in the occupied territories. It became recently clear that the conditioning of, of existence by presence not only threat threatened Palestinian society, but endangered the survival of the Jewish state. The Palestinian had to pay the price of the Israeli formula and have to pay the price of the new formula also. The new unilateral Israeli policies are part of the Israeli attempt to correct its own mistakes without paying the price for them. The separation wall as well as the pull-out policy in the, is the best, are the best manifestations of the Israeli attempts to overcome the threats of the Jewish state to the Jewish state. This understanding of sovereignty has much price which has to be paid by the weak side in the conflict. The fourth point, strategy and struggle. Israelis, this will be short, Israelis and Palestinians have established a complex relationship between their national strategies and means and tactics to achieve their goals. The weakness of the Jewish people in Europe has brought the Zionist movement and the State of Israel to adopt a strategy of creating facts that demonstrate its inability to understand the limits of, and the repercussions of, of, uh, of this strategy. On the other hand, the surprise of the Palestinians in the 1948 war and the 1967 defeat have led to a philosophy of suspension and mistrust. Suspicion and mistrust, sorry. The mutual killing taking place since the mid-1990s, especially the suicide bombings and the policy of Chesulim, demonstrate the uh, uh, biblical philosophy of teeth for teeth and eye for eye that both sides have adopted. This philosophy demonstrates the immaturity of both sides and their inability to recognize the vicious circle in which violence have led them. Fifth point, state and, strat uh, and sovereignty. Sorry. The Palestinians do not yet have a state. Israel was declared as a state of the Jewish people in 1948. This state is viewed by Jewish society in transcendental terms. The search for sovereignty has turned the state into a holy tool and an absolute guarantee of survival. As a result, the Israeli state has developed Spartan political culture. Therefore, the Israeli public views any means that are claimed to guarantee survival as legitimate. The Israeli dominant elites view any threat almost in existential terms. Hamas, for instance, is characterized as an exist existential thre threat, thereby legitimizing policies that go far beyond securing Israelis. The Israeli state is not only demanding the Palestinians to accept its sovereignty over territories that were occupied in 1967, but also seeking to utilize the fact that the Palestinians do not understand the meaning of the Weberian conception of the state in order to promote its own view of reality. As long as the Palestinians do not play the political conflict according to the Israeli terms of it, they are not only considered non-partners for negotiations, but they are also forced to accept Israeli preconditions before even becoming partners. The establishment of the separation wall is one of the manifestations of the Israeli use of its power in order to... Yeah, I'm finishing. In order to impose its own terms on the, uh, on the, on the mutual relationship. The wall is presented in, Israeli, in Israel in residu residual terms. Since there is no partner and since we have to take care of security, then the wall is the only way out of a situation that was developed after summer 2000. Is it, I would like to ask, is, it the, wall, uh, is, the, wall as a, is, a, is the wall a result of the way Israelis view the meaning of sovereignty? Isn't the wall a result of meaning of Jewish state, and so on and so on? Recognition and reconciliation, the last point. In realistic terms, Israelis and Palestinians have managed to mutually interrupt the normality of common life 
in their civil societies, in their mutual civil societies, of course. Both sides must recognize certain aspects of their existence. Israelis must recognize the coloniality, their coloniality, and its implications on the normality of Palestinian peoplehood. Palestinians retaliate with their effort to destabilize Jewish efforts to normalize their national presence in modern history. Recognition becomes, therefore, becomes a precondition for any future reconciliation. It has to start with the mutual recognition of one's self-misdeeds and its implications on the other side's normality. Only after that can be two. Only after that uh, can the two sides recognize each other mutually, and such measures, of course, could lead to uh, a possible uh, reconciliation between them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amal. Thank you, Amal, for presenting your perspective of this conflict in such a brilliant way. And we now move to Professor Asher Sasser, who is the director of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle East and African Studies. He's also a professor at the Department of Middle East and African History. His um, areas of specialization are the modern Middle East, modern Middle Eastern history in general, religion and state um, in uh, the um, Middle East, uh, the Arab-Israeli issues and special reference to Jordan and the Palestinians. I would also add that he is really the leading authority on Jordan um, in this country. Uh, professor Sasser was a, a visiting professor at Cornell University, University of Chicago, and Brandeis University. Bakasha Asher. Thank you very much, uh, Shimon. Uh, my topic, uh, historical narratives and end of conflict, does have uh, a certain measure of uh, overlap with uh, both of our previous speakers, uh, but I think we all come from somewhat uh, different perspectives to discussing this similar question, and different perspectives, I must say, not surprisingly so. Um, <clears throat> I would like to first refer to uh, the conflicting narratives of 1948 in the Jewish-Israeli perception and in the Palestinian perception because I think these conflicting narratives are directly related to the problematics of end of conflict. One of the major stumbling blocks uh, that separates us from this ultimate end of conflict is the profoundly different narratives that the parties bring to the table. And in some way, asking the Palestinians to recognize the end of conflict is asking them somehow to rewrite their history, which is not something that nations are likely to do. Uh, one can talk about political settlements, but personally, I think that one of the failures of the Camp David process of 2000 was the way it was framed, expected the parties somehow to rewrite their own historical experience. That rewriting of history should be left for other places and not for the negotiating table, I think. There is an unbridgeable gap in the narratives. Presently unbridgeable, maybe one day it will be bridgeable, but at present it is unbridgeable. These narratives are not just slightly different. They are diametrically opposed to each other in total. The Zionist enterprise, from the Israeli Jewish point of view, is an act of ultimate self-defense of the Jews against their rather miserable historical fate. For the Palestinians, this very same enterprise is not self-defense, but net aggression from the very first Jewish settler in Palestine. Israel's victory in 1948 was, from the Jewish point of view, an act of defiance against their rather miserable historical fate. And the fact that this victory in 1948 came just a few years after the Holocaust spelt this defiance even in more emphatic terms. The greatest victory of the Jewish people in 2,000 years. Jewish statehood and sovereignty. Literally, rising from the ashes of horrendous destruction 
to national liberation. For the Palestinians, it is exactly the opposite. Not slightly different, but completely the reverse. <coughs> it is not national liberation, but the Palestinian Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe. Not victory, but traumatic defeat. Dispersal, their loss of homeland, refugeedom. This traumatic defeat, this dispersal and loss of homeland, is the formative experience of Palestinian-ness. This is what Palestinian identity is. The formative experience and core of Palestinian identity is this relationship with this enormous act of historical injustice. The very identity of Palestinians is wedded to this profound sense of grievance and historical injustice. That leads us, these two narratives, to a debate, and Amal was uh, uh, weaving through this debate, I think, quite uh, considerably in his own talk, the debate on historical responsibility. Or we could say, guilt. The term the Palestinians use for 1948, Nakba, disaster, catastrophe, some would even say Holocaust, as a translation for the word Nakba. Nakba focuses on what social psychology calls the external locus of control. One who has undergone a Nakba, a traumatic experience like a flood, a tsunami, or an earthquake, is not responsible The poor people who were drowned in the tsunami are not responsible for what happened to them. Sadiq al Azam, in his Naktir Zati Bad al Hazima, self criticism after the defeat, which he wrote after 1967, Sadiq al Azam, a Syrian, referred to this term Nakba. And he says, the term Nakba is for one upon whom a catastrophe has befallen and he cannot be held responsible for it. Or if he was responsible, then that responsibility is very partial in relation to the enormity and magnitude of the event. For this reason, we the Arabs, he says, have become used to attributing catastrophes to fate, time, and nature. In other words, to factors over which we have no control. The use of this term Nakba to describe 1948 automatically, from a Palestinian point of view, puts the onus of responsibility for what happened in 1948 fairly and squarely and totally at the Israeli doorstep. And the Israelis are expected to um, admit their responsibility, if not to say their guilt, which, as much as the Palestinians will not rewrite their history, the Israelis will not admit this guilt. From the Israeli point of view, if we go to the old school of Israeli history, not the new historians, but the old school of Israeli history, they would have made the following points about this evolution of war. It's the Arabs who launched the war against the partition that they rejected. It is the Israelis who were the few against the many in this war. The refugees fled at the insistence of their leaders. And Israel always wanted peace with the Arabs, which the Arabs did not want with Israel. Then came the new historians. And the new historians wrote a totally different narrative on all of these four issues. I will dwell only on one of these historians who relates to the issue which is most critical to our question, the refugees. And this new historian, is very well known to all, I'm sure. Uh, Benny Morris, uh, who has written on this question more extensively, more seriously, I think, than, than anyone else. And 
Morris, in his first book, which he published in the 1980s, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, refuted the Zionist narrative. And he did this very systematically on the basis of a very methodical search in the Israeli archives and based on Israeli material uh, in the main. There was no blanket call for the Palestinians to leave, says Morris. There was expulsion. Not only expulsion, there was flight, but there was also expulsion and a lot of it. But, concludes Morris, there was no grand design. The war was not conducted with a grand design of expulsion in mind. The Palestinian refugee problem was born of the war and an accidental result of it. But interestingly, just as the new historians reflect an approach which is different to that of the old historians, Morris himself has changed over time. And Morris has written another book on the same question, which is called The Birth of the Palestinian Question, Revisited. Now, obviously, 1948 has not changed in the meantime, between 1987 and 2004. What has changed is the present. All history is contemporary, says Benedetto Croce, the Italian. It is a dialogue between the present and the past, of course it is. The trouble is that the present shifts all the time. And as we speak, the present, of course, is changing. And with it, our way of seeing the past. This is true of Morris himself. Morris wrote his first book in the wake of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. He wrote his second book on the same subject after the last five years of suicide bombings. His perceptions of responsibility have changed. Not because of the past, but because of the present. In Morris's first book, he says, the Palestinian refugee problem was born of war, not by design, Jewish or Arab. It was largely a byproduct of Arab and Jewish fears of the protracted bitter fighting that characterized the first Israeli-Arab war. In a smaller part, it was the deliberate creation of Jewish and Arab military commanders and politicians. Therefore, the responsibility is very equally set out. That is so in the conclusions, but if one reads Morris's book, the balance of responsibility is somewhat different, much more on the Israeli side. And therefore, Palestinians and others who uh, supporters of the Palestinian cause portrayed Morris's book as a revelation of Israeli responsibility for the refugee question, which is not exactly what Morris said, but that is how the book was then used. But then came the War of 2000, and Morris revised his book. That same paragraph that starts the conclusions starts as follows. The first Arab-Israeli war of 1948 was launched by the Palestinian Arabs, who rejected the UN partition. This is Morris as if he were the old Israeli histo history. Same guy. But this time is 2004, not 1987. So perceptions of responsibility shift even amongst the new historians. What impact does this have on the peace process? First of all, what is this peace process about? Is it about political accommodation? Two states for the two peoples? Or is it about the rectification of historical injustice? These are two very different peace processes. The one is soluble, the other is not. It could, of course, be some of both of these things. <clears throat> but the problem inherent in peacemaking with these narratives in the background, how does one achieve end of conflict when the Palestinian collective identity is shaped by the memory of 1948 as the incarnation of evil and injustice? The refugee question is not about statehood. The return of the refugees to Israel proper 
is not about the achievement of Palestinian statehood. It is about correcting the injustice of 1948. And thus creates a problem which cuts to the existential core of the conflict. Israelis feel threatened by this kind of perception. That this could spell the beginning of the end of their enterprise of national revival. There is a cardinal difference between Resolution 242 and the refugee issue and the settlement of the refugee issue within the framework of 242. You can subordinate the solution of the refugee question to the implementation of the two-state solution. That is, the return of the refugees will be to the state of Palestine. That is the subordination of the refugee question, the subordination of 1948 to 1967. That is to say, the two-state solution is what guarantees the agreement. The refugee question is in within that framework. There is a piece of paper that calls for this kind of solution. It is the Ayalon Nuseva initiative, which says exactly this. Sari Nuseva and Ami Ayalon speak of a two-state solution which subordinates the refugee question to the two-state reality. That is, the return of Palestinian refugees is perfectly legitimate to the state of Palestine, not to the state of Israel. There is a different unofficial document, the Geneva Accords, which have been mentioned, which doesn't do precisely that. In the Geneva Accords, the question of return is also to Israel, not only, but also. It does not strictly limit the refugee return to the state of Palestine. And here I would just make a historical observation of the two giants of the relative national movements that we are talking about, Ben Gurion on the one hand and Yasser Arafat on the other. They, have, they had two very different types of obsessions. Ben Gurion in the late 40s, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, when there was a critical mass of Jews in Palestine capable of establishing a state, and a UN partisan resolution, Ben Gurion was obsessed with the idea of Jewish sovereignty and statehood. Arafat, I would argue, was never obsessed by the idea of sovereignty and statehood, but was obsessed by the sense of historical injustice that had to be corrected. And that correction of historical injustice from the Palestinian point of view leads to two different types of issues that are on the table. There are the 1967 questions. That's the easy stuff. Just issues like Jerusalem settlements and borders, that's the easy stuff. Because all these 1967 questions are within the framework of what is a two-state reality. But in the Palestinian dimension of the conflict, as opposed to the interstate conflict, Israel-Egypt, Israel-Syria, there is another bag of questions. And they are the 1948 questions. Refugees. There is a qualitative difference between them. The 1967 issues relate to Israel's extent. The 1948 questions relate to Israel's being, as the state of the Jewish people, as it defines itself. And these two bags of issues are, I think, at the moment, the qualitative difference between conflict resolution and conflict management. It is difficult to resolve this conflict, as everyone has already said. But it may not be that difficult to manage it. The unilateralist conclusion that Israeli policymakers have arrived at, rightly or wrongly, people may like it more or less, is a form of conflict management, clearly not resolution. And those who suggest this policy clearly believe that they are managing the conflict. They know they're not resolving it. But this is a recognition that the end of conflict remains beyond reach. Thank you. Thank you, Asher, for 
very stimulating presentation. Um, Moti, can we go a little beyond one o'clock? Okay, so so we have about half an hour for. Mm -hmm. This is at the expense of lunch, I understand. <laughs> okay, so let us hear questions and comments. Um, please. A microphone. Where is it? Question. Question is to Professor Susser. I enjoyed your presentation immensely. Um, if these narratives are so diametrically opposed, it's not as if there's the possibility of accommodation, compromise. These are, in effect, denial of the other. Yes. So, and you spoke about this at the end. What are the practical implications of this? The open-ended management by the Israeli state of a conflict that's not going to go away and the occupation of a people who are not going to go away. And for the Palestinians, the reality being that there's no out from their predicament. And how long is this sustainable? Now, as a practical matter, I've met many Israelis here who say the present can be managed indefinitely, especially after the creation of the wall. The question is what happens on the other side. So. What does this incompatibility of narratives mean concretely? I know you addressed this toward the end, but if you could speak a little bit more about it, that would be very useful. Mati. Uh, two, two points, or two comments to Amal Jamal. First of all, I, I strongly recommend that you revi re revisit your concepts of weakness and strengths in such a conflict. Even in uh, conflict between two conventional forces, it's very difficult to measure the balance of power between the two. It is certainly so in a conflict like this between a conventional force and mobilized people under occupation, under, under conquest. And there is a dialectics of weakness of power. What you term power can become a weakness, and weakness can be a source of power. And I think this is, this is the situation. What you consider the weakness of the Palestinians is perhaps the greatest Israeli fear. Um, uh, there is other implication to this uh, dichotomy that, that you use, is that, that in your story, uh, it's the, the, str the strong is responsible, and the weak has got no responsibility. Now, first of all, I think since I believe that there is a, a stalemate from the point of view of balance of power, there is no strong and there is no weak. And second of all, even a weak partner in the conflict has got res responsibility towards his own destiny. Second of all is the, the notion that uh, the two sides have to uh, recognize the misdeeds before uh, reconciliation can be made. This is, this is a Christian concept. If you go to the priest and you tell him your sins, then he absolves you and then you are happy. Yeah, but in, in such conflicts, it, it, it doesn't occur. I know that there is now, it is quite, quite popular in, in academic circles in the West to expect Israel to, uh, to emulate the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, no, I think it's a, it's a, it's a disastrous concept. For, for, for our conflict. I mean, if you just take out of the cupboard all the skeletons on both sides, it, it will certainly not lead to reconciliation. I think, I think people have got ways of dealing with their misdeeds and with their sufferings. Uh, and it takes a, lo it has, it takes a long time. Uh, and, and I think it is the reality is the ma main agent of, uh, of this, this process rather than any planned process of spewing out guilt. Um, I would like just to say something about the polarity of the narratives. I think they used to be so polarized. And I think there is a process uh, in which they, they become a little bit, <laughs> uh, they are approaching each other. Now, let me ask you, uh, the Oslo Accord has no uh, meaning in bringing somewhat the two sides about there is no mutual recognition 
element, basic element of mutual recognition between the Jews and the Palestinians uh, has nothing to do, I mean, not, nothing happened to this, uh, to this narratives. Let me just bring one piece of information. It's not about the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza or in the diaspora, but Palestinians in Israel. In the last survey that it took of the Arabs and Jews in Israel, there was a question about the settlement of the, Palestinian, uh, of the refugee question in Palestine only. 70% of the Arabs of Israel accepted this. It's hard to say that there is no change in their, their narrative. Now, I had two questions about the narratives. One about the responsibility of 1948, the, 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 the Nakba, and the other, who is guilty you know, for the conflict, generally questions. One third of the Arabs in Israel and one third of the Jews of Israel. They say the other side is not the main culprit or the guilty. I, mean, there is, I think there is some change and I think it's time for us to see that to, to notice these changes. It's not just people are becoming more pragmatic about the political solutions. I think they are rethinking their positions, uh, I think in the, in the public at large, but also among intellectuals. Now let me ask uh, uh, just a point. Uh, uh, Amal said that the, this, uh, the unilateral disengagement, the Jews want to correct uh, their mistakes, right? And they are not paying any price for it. I don't know if this is your evaluation or, or the Palestinian uh, point of view, but from the Jewish point of view, they are paying maximal price. They are giving up territory, they are giving air to Israel. I mean, it's from their point of view. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, you, they are, you are not just getting rid of Palestinians' population. You are, you are getting rid of a Jewish homeland. <laughs> so it's, so what is the, whose point of view you are now presenting? I don't understand. Uh, just may, maybe to, to bring you some consolation, you are not alone. Uh, such uh, discussions have now started in other parts of, of the world, uh, particularly in, um, let's say, the Baltic states now, are um, claiming that, uh, of course, the Second World War was not the war uh, which uh, um, uh, Hitler was defeated, but it was the war where the Baltic states were occupied. And, and therefore, they are extremely unhappy that the Russians uh, refused to rewrite their history and they have not yet uh, kind of come to a point where to uh, agree to disagree. But they're still uh, pushing that well, our, our version of history is, is uh, um, uniquely right, and so you have to, uh, to rewrite your history. But, uh, of course, this, um, this conflict is not so protracted that, uh, that this one is. Thank you. We go around the table, please. If, if I may, and an observation along, along similar lines, which is, is that Israel-Palestinian conflict is, is, uh, is not unique in the respect that you, you put it. And, and I think it is useful to have some comparative perspective if, on this, because I think in some ways perhaps can soften uh, what are very sharp edges to your, your analysis. I mean, if you think about uh, Northern Ireland, Protestants and Catholics certainly don't agree on a common common narrative. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Muslims, Croats, and Serbs certainly don't agree on a common narrative. Has that prevented a a settlement? Uh, we're we're still in the process, arguably, of achieving one, but we've made, I think, uh, very considerable progress. And maybe. The relevant difference here is the fact that you have third-party involvement in these other conflicts if left to their own devices in each case. It's arguable that they wouldn't have been able to come as far as they have. Well, as, as we go around the table, I think it will be my turn now to ask a question. Uh, oh, Ehuda, you have priority. 
Sorry, just uh, uh, reminded of this discussion, uh, mostly what Amal said and the reaction that uh, Moti had to him. Uh, about two decades ago in London, a uh, conversation with Eli Kaduri, I was then coming very much from the left, and he was coming from the other side, obviously. And things have changed over the years, and um, when I talked about power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, his reaction was two sentences. One, yes, power corrupts, but powerlessness also corrupts. And then he said, never forget, I mean, don't assume that there is inherent virtue in powerlessness. And I think these two things made me think for quite a while and impacted the way I did social history ever since. And uh, I'm just throwing it into the discussion. Um, I want to go back to the issue of narratives. Um, the two speakers on my left showed us very convincingly that the narratives in this conflict are diametrically opposed. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I think, quite obvious. My question is about the acceptance of narratives. Um, we know that narratives are instrumental, that, that nationalist movements need them, they have to create them, that um, uh, every, actually every ideology needs a historical um, interpretation that will serve its cause. These uh, narratives are instrumental, and we are very understanding to, to this need. We are very tolerant, actually, uh, to uh, the fact that uh, there are different narratives in the world. And basically, they're all legitimate, and they're all on the same level. Uh, we have our doubts about objectivity in history anyway, and as Asha said, the, all history is contemporary, and so on. My question is whether there is a limit to this or not. Um, whether uh, certain ideologies can have such little support from evidence that they must be classified as a somewhat different kind of uh, narratives, different kind of historical narratives. Uh, let me uh, give you an example. Uh, you know, in the, in the process of molding the uh, Turkish nationalist movement, a historical narrative appeared that claimed that Turks are descendants of the Hittites. And the Hittite, uh, Hittite uh, civilization is actually the cradle of all major civilization in this part of the world. Um, and the museum, the Hittite Museum was created and so on. Um, we would say yes, this is also a legitimate uh, historical narrative. But it is perhaps a historical narrative of a different kind. And the question I am asking you, is it at all useful to try to apply some academic criteria to different historical narratives and, uh, and draw conclusions from that? Uh, or would it be better simply to ignore the question? All those who, are, who have some experience in dialogues with the Palestinians, no, this question should be avoided. You can talk about with the Palestinians on any question you want. Don't talk about history. Don't talk about historical narratives. And from the practical point of view, I think this is a good guideline. But, um, in a framework which is devoted to analytical, academic, historical study of this question, would it not be almost imperative to examine narratives also from another point of view? We are going around here. Did I, I skipped you, I'm sorry. Or okay, continue. We are on the right side, no? No, okay. I, I think it's your right to speak now. Oh, you passed your right. So we are going here on the right side. Bakasha. In, in partial answer to the, the, the question you just asked, our institute supports a lot of development of common narrative when we've been supporting one that particularly large effort in the Balkans involving about 250 professional historians who are reaching some common conclusions, including Serbs, Albanians, Croats. It's absolutely not a, pre absolutely not a precondition to 
a peace settlement. You can call it management if you like, but uh, I don't know any of the recent conflicts in which there has been settlement of a common narrative before there was an arrangement uh, to live together. I have two specific questions. Uh, the first to Professor Sasser. I think, I think you were a little bit unfair to Benny Morris. Um, both his, um, his books on the refugee problem, I, they, as a matter of fact, I mean, when he, um, when he uh, produces the results of his research, he says more or less the same thing. He says that some of the refugees uh, were incited to flee, others fled because they were afraid, and then once the war started, there was positive expulsion. He says this in the first version and in the second version, and I think the implication that, his, that the Intifada um, affected his narrative, that's where I find the slight unfairness. I would explain the, uh, uh, the development in, in Benny Morris's uh, 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 narratives differently. I think that in the first, his politics strongly affected the style of his presentation, whereas in the second version, he learned to separate his politics from his historical findings. But I, this is just my reaction to what you say. Now, I find very um, uh, interesting one, uh, one of the works mentioned, I forget by whom, um, which is called um, uh, what, uh, Our Mistakes or, or were an Arab... Oh, uh, exactly yes. Now, I, uh, so I'd like... Exactly. Now, I, I've read something, I don't know if it's the same author or not, uh, along those lines. And that kind of approach is very interesting, and I was wondering how prevalent it was, how many people are, whether this is a, a developing line or, a, or, a, um, or, a, or not. Thank you. And now this is the last question, really, because time is limited. There is the I can come Paul. back to you. Yes, Paul. Okay, so these, these will be the last two questions or uh, comments. Yeah, I want to try and relate those uh, in very interesting uh, lectures to uh, our topic here of uh, nationalism and ethnicity and identity. And I think what's interesting is actually the change the f new frameworks of uh, power and of space affect uh, the, the national narratives and therefore the national identity. And I think in our short history here, protracted, but it's about a hundred years conflict, there were many tremendous structural changes and it's interesting to see that both of you presented those narratives as almost as unchanged. And I, I join what Samuha said, that this is the, the interesting thing and there is a change. First of all, to Amal Jamal, you presented, I think, opposite to what they said. I think you, 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 you uh, over-presented the parity between uh, the two. First of all, the empty land trying to uh, vanish the other is a Jewish part of the Jewish narrative, but it's not part of the Palestinian narrative. But the Palestinian narrative acknowledges the Jews, albeit quite negatively, but it's always there. Uh, I research, for example, the whole uh, progression of the way uh, Zionists and uh, Palestinians uh, sing about the land. And in all the Jewish narrative, there's hardly ever an Arab. In the Palestinian singing and writing, there's a lot of Jews. So maybe a comment on that. The other comment is, how is the post-67 uh, new geography affected the narratives? This is uh, interesting to see whether the one uh, existence under one regime has actually changed the narratives and whether, Amal, you trace a new um, idea or new old idea of binationalism among the Palestinian scholars and intellectuals now coming and of course that affects the uh, uh, identity. And last one for Asher, you more than Amal presented very um, um, unchangeable narratives as if they uh, really, uh, over time, no change. What about um, 
What about the Nakba itself? The Nakba appears in the 70s, 80s among the Palestinians. It appears, I think, as part of the greater oppression. Um, of course, it exists from 48, but it's very minor in the Palestinian narrative. I think the Nakba rises and continue to rise, this is my impression, as a part of the powerlessness, as we're saying here, uh, and um, to join to Sami Samucha, how about the Palestinians in Israel? How about the different narrative and identity they have developed uh, and which shows that narratives are uh, able to change over time? Uh, mine's a request rather than a question. It's a request you actually comment on each other's papers because each of them were complementary and each of them set up what was a, a discussion of uh, incommensurable dialogues or, or narrative forms which the dialogues do not come across as uh, finding some balance between them. And yet there was an intrinsic and unstated tension between the two papers and I wondered if you might want to comment on those. Okay, so uh, now it's, it's your turn, and uh, let me ask you to be very selective. There is really no time for referring to all the questions uh, that were asked. They're all important, they're all interesting, but uh, keep in mind uh, the uh, time limit. Um, Asher was the last, so we'll get him. It'll be the first. Okay. Wherever it's more convenient for you. If this does not mean that you're going to give another paper. I sure am. There was a comment just as we began the discussion uh, that this also this meant the deferral of lunch, the discussion. So I will really be brief because I, I, I know what I'm doing. Um, but but there, there is, uh, I think there is a, a kind of a common strain uh, in, in the questions uh, referred to me which mean that there is something quite basic in what I said that I didn't explain uh, well enough. My distinction is uh, between the capability to achieve end of conflict in a declaration of end of conflict which is what the Israelis asked of the Palestinians and a settlement. My criticism of Camp David in 2000 was why don't you negotiate over a settlement? You can have one. Just don't ask them to declare end of conflict. Don't ask the other side, in addition to the conflict and the, the, the arrival at a settlement, to undress themselves in terms of the way they understand their history. It's like asking the Israelis, after they withdraw from Hebron, to, if the Palestinians just want to be sure that the Israelis have really gone, to ask the Prime Minister of Israel not only to withdraw from Hebron, but also to declare that the Jews have no historical rights there and never ever had. They won't do that. They'll leave Hebron. And sure they will. There won't be one Jew left in Hebron in a few years' time. I'm quite sure of that. But the Israelis will never declare that they have no historical rights there. The notion of getting the other side to declare end of conflict, this, this is what I'm actually grappling with. There is a very clear possibility, and Shimon alluded to that, of a settlement. We all know exactly what it will look like. There is not a complete denial of the other. There is a change in the political attitudes. I agree with what uh, Oren was saying and what uh, Sami Smokha was saying. But where I see the difficulty is not in the fact that political positions are changing, but in the incapability of the parties at present to accord the other side, not a recognition of their being, but a recognition of the justice of their being. And this is what the Israelis asked the Palestinians to do. And this the Palestinians will not do. They may do it one day. But let me remind you that we have peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan. Neither of them were asked to declare end of conflict. All they were asked to do was to make peace with Israel, which is quite enough. And with the Palestinians, Israel should have asked for the same. The reason why the Israelis did not was because the Israelis see the Palestinian conflict in different terms. The Israelis are inherently suspicious that with the Palestinians there is no clear finality. Whereas with Egypt and Jordan there is. We know exactly where it is. There's an international boundary and that's where it ends. 
with the Palestinians, there is this sense that this, it, it may go on forever. So, so of the Palestinians, the Israelis asked, kindly declared when we arrive at the, somewhere around the 67 boundaries, that this is the end of it, that there will be no further demands. But this is the mentality of lawyers and insurance agents. You cannot ask another people to do that about their history because they won't do it. That is what I'm saying. I'm not saying that political positions haven't changed. And a word about Hamas. You asked previously about Hamas. Hamas has taken, in recent years, very pragmatic positions. Hamas's participation in the elections in the West Bank and Gaza, in and of themselves, is the height of pragmatism. What is Hamas doing by participating in these elections? They are participating in elections for Palestinian institutions that only represent the West Bank and Gaza. They inadvertently, or uh, consciously, but uh, not explicitly, are accepting the two-state reality. They were elected in elections for a parliament that only represents the West Bank and Gaza, in which only the Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza participated. This is uh, uh, acquiescing in the reduction of Palestine. Now, Hamas, in principle, does not accept that. And the historical narrative of Hamas is, as Mayer, I think, rightly presented it. That doesn't mean that a two-state settlement between Israel and Hamas is not possible. But to ask of Hamas to recognize the justice of the Zionist endeavor is asking just too much, and it won't happen. This is what I'm trying to say. Not that there is a denial of the other. The Israelis, by withdrawing the Prime Minister, this one, and Israel's previous Prime Minister, uh, Ariel Sharon, no great moderate on Palestinian issues in the past, as you will all remember, recognized in a speech to the UN just a few months ago the right of the Palestinians to sovereignty and statehood. There is no denial of the other here. So it is really not as dichotomous as it may have sounded, because what I meant to say was that there is a difference between a settlement and this idealism of end of conflict. A settlement is, is another story, and something that even with Hamas, I would say, uh, is a possibility. A, a comment about weakness and strength. The shield of the man there, I, I will conclude with this. Uh, a, co a comment about weakness and strength. Israel, in terms of its military prowess, I think has definitely had the upper hand in the confrontation with the Palestinians in the last five years. There is no question uh, of the supremacy of, of Israeli power in the, in, in the equation with the Palestinians. But having said that, the Israelis are withdrawing. Why? The Israelis are withdrawing because they recognize their inherent weakness in this conflict, not their unlimited strength. And the Israelis have an inherent weakness in this conflict. Rightly or wrongly, people may like it more or less. But the creation of a state for the Jewish people means the creation of a state in which the Jews are a majority. Israel will have to withdraw willy-nilly, whether it likes it or not, if it wants to maintain its raison d'etre. And in that respect, it suffers from an inherent weakness in relation to the neighborhood. Because in the neighborhood, it is the Jews who are the minority, by far. This occupation erodes the majority-minority equation. It erodes Israeli international legitimacy and therefore turns time against Israel. And Israel has no time. In this conflict, people talk about asymmetry. Time is on the Palestinian side in this game. We know it and they know it. And as a result, in this equation of who does time work for, not that anybody knows really on whose side time is, this is all about perceptions. But the Palestinians do not share, rightly or wrongly, they do not share the urgency that the Israelis have in creating a two-state reality. From the Palestinian point of view, it might as well remain a one-state reality, in which in the future they become the majority and the Jews become the minority. That is the end of Israel as we know it. It is the Israelis who are under the constraint of time, not because of their stupendous power, but because of their inherent weakness. <laughs> A uh, few, few comments. I'm not sure that I, uh, I claim that there is uh, one unilateral narr Palestinian narrative or Israeli narrative. Uh, I believe in, in multiple narratives, and I think there are much more than one narrative in both sides. Um, the issue is where, where, where these narratives meet and where do they confront 
each other. I think this, these are the points. This is the most interesting point in, in uh, narrativity and, and the conception of time and so on. I would like to agree with, with you in terms of the inherent Israeli weakness, in terms of the conception of the relationship with the place and the conception of power. And Hamas was fully aware of this inherent weakness until the wall started to be built. Hamas changed its policy, among other things, because of the wall. Because as long as there was no wall, its policy of flooding the Jewish state with, with settle, I mean, the, the occupied territories with Jewish settlements and erasing the difference between occupied territories and Israel was the strategy, actually, in order to create a, a, two, a binational state or, or uh, demolish any uh, uh, demographic option for a Jewish state. And this, this policy was led by Israel. This the policy was led by Israel. Uh, when the wall was uh, started to be built, and Hamas saw this option, besides, of course, other factors, international factors that have to do with 9-11 and have to do with, with, with the war on terror and so on and so on, it had to change its own, uh, its own uh, course. Now, I would, I would like to support also another point, that Hamas is a very pragmatic uh, political movement. Uh, it is a pragmatic political movement in the sense that when we differentiate between the, the narrative, it carries on, and I pointed out the narrative. The narrative is, is very broad. It changes, it, it tries to change the whole conception of, of uh, uh, Middle Eastern reality, not only between Jews and, and, and Palestinians, but also the whole, the whole Arab world. Um, on the other hand, Hamas went into these elections aware that by getting into the elections, it has to accept the limitations of power within the, 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 the political authority that it's taking over. So it, 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 we have to consider that also. And here I think I'll come to a theoretical point that narrative is not disconnected from political reality. Narrative is there not because it's, uh, it, it reflects uh, what uh, we have to consider only what people think. I think uh, narratives are there in order to serve certain political uh, political uh, uh, interests to serve to promote certain political policies and and uh, th that's how they should be uh, uh, considered. In terms of power powerlessness, uh, that powerlessness co corrupts. I agree. I mean, I think Kaduri is very very uh, brilliant on this point. That it's 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 uh, Eli Kaduri, right? Well, uh, very very brilliant in the sense that yeah, well, giving up responsibility. Uh, for what happens to you, uh, and I think if we look at Palestinian history, Palestinian historians, uh, 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 I think there is also new historians there. And if you look at what Rashid Khalidi writes, and what other people wrote in the 1950s and 60s, also you said there uh, a major difference in terms of caring, uh, conceiving the Palestinian elite as as uh, as responsible. And when you look at my the two books that were mentioned, uh, Palestinian National Movement's Political Contention, about the two elites, the Islamic elite and the uh, national elite, I say it clearly that, that uh, we can't conceive Israel as responsible for everything. It's, it's impossible. I mean, you can't uh, uh, project all your, uh, what happens to you to the other side, otherwise you're losing in terms of, uh, you're losing your own subjectivity as a people. But, and here a big but, I think, we can't ignore power as a factor. Yeah? It has to be into, uh, taken into consideration, and I think Israel has uh, much, much more power in realist terms. In realist terms, it, it has much more power to promote its own policies, and we see it happening in the wall. If Israel didn't have enough power, it couldn't have enforced the wall. It couldn't have enforced the pullout from the Gaza Strip and so on and so on, and there are repercussions of these policies that have to be taken into consideration. You can't, and post-colonial theory, you mentioned post-colonial theory, we know from other experiences that even when you pull out, even if you live in England and, uh, and you left uh, India 50 years ago, uh, you, you are not, you're not uh, irresponsible for what you did in the past, and you can't ignore the problems that will follow you. The problems will follow you. I mean, the fact that you are closing the Palestinians behind the wall doesn't mean that the problems that Israel, the Israeli occupation created will disappear suddenly. 
There are hundreds of thousands of Indians and Pakistanis in, in, in uh, Great Britain. And there, will be, and there is already 1.3 million Palestinians inside Israel. And if, if a, a settlement is, is met in the near future, Israel will accept another few thousands of refugees to settle down in Israel. And it was spoken about in, in, the, in, in Camp David. So I think uh, we have to consider this issue. We have to consider the fact that you can't, you can't separate as much as, I think, uh, uh, going back to uh, uh, theory, that you can't separate between these two, uh, two uh, presentations. I think they, they interact, interrelate, and uh, 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 go into, uh, into, uh, into uh, a direct relationship. Uh, one last point. I know time is passing, but one last point about... Uh, um, the Arabs, Arabs in Israel. You mentioned Sami Arabs in Israel, Palestinians in Israel, and, and so on and so on. I, I think uh, um, you are right in the sense that uh, uh, the Israeli, what I call the Israeli uh, experience of the Palestinians in Israel, Israeli experience, uh, not the state, not the Zionist ideology, but the experience itself. The fact that they live here and in daily connection with, uh, with their surroundings, uh, especially with the Jewish society, has changed, created slight change in their perception of, uh, of uh, reality. And, and many of them understand, let us get rid of the conflict already, we want to live in a normal, in normal situation. But I think they are submissive. They have to submit themselves to what the elite in the West Bank and Gaza say in terms of solving the conflict, and therefore, it's politically, it's irrelevant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amal. It strikes me as interesting that uh, Amal uh, emphasizes uh, Israeli power while Asha speaks about Israeli weakness. I think they are both right. Uh, let, me, let me thank uh, the speakers, Asher Sasser, Amar Jamal, and uh, in absentia, Mayor Litvak. Thank you all.